Amen. Amen. Well, today we're looking at the story of an underdog, and this is a, this is a really cool story. This is a story many of us probably learned when we were a kid, and this is an underdog. His name is Gideon. Now, Gideon is, is absolutely the most ordinary person out there. So if you have ever felt like an ordinary individual, if you've ever like, looked in the mirror and thought, you are normal, or maybe you're like, I wish I was normal, right? Uh, if you've ever felt like maybe you didn't measure up or, or you didn't have all the goods, you weren't the total package, this message is for you. And so I want you to take your Bibles, open to Judges chapter 6. I've titled this message, What are the Odds? What are the Odds? If you have a gray note card, you'll find it on the seat back in front of you. Take it out right across the top. What are the Odds? And I've loved this series because I feel like this underdog series is the story of our church. What are the what are the odds of God calling a guy like me to pastor a church like this, right? What are the odds of God using an individual like you to do the things that you're doing? What are the odds? And we serve a God that is bigger than the odds. Aren't you thankful for that? So in Judges chapter 6, if you haven't found it yet, you're like, my goodness, I still haven't found Judges. I've been working on this for 10 minutes. It's the seventh book in the Old Testament, all right? You'll find like Deuteronomy, Joshua, then Judges. And when you land in Judges, what you need to know is that God has a chosen group of people. They're called the Israelites. They're his people. And God has made them a promise. He says, if you'll obey me, I'm going to lead you. I'm your God. You're my people. They started off as slaves in Egypt, and now he, God is bringing them to the promised land. They have acquired the promised land. God has done miracle after miracle after miracle on their behalf, and suddenly they have settled in, and life is good But in the midst of life being good, something tragic has happened. An entire generation has grown up, and their parents did not pass on to them what they learned of the Lord. One generation is passing on, another generation is raising up, and the parents failed to tell the kids, to instill in the kids the importance of of faithfulness to God. The parents didn't tell the kids about the miracles of God, and the parents didn't teach the kids to live a life of obedience and honor towards God. And so an entire generation has grown up, and they don't know who the Lord is. They don't have a relationship with him. And so they've begun to follow false gods, and they've begun to worship false gods, and it's led, to some, led them to some pretty dark places. And that's where we pick up in Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, if you found it, say, I found it. All right, and if you're still looking for it, just good luck, all right? <laughs> Judges 6 verse 1 says this. It says, the Israelites did what? Say it with me. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. I told you, they're in some pretty bad places. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he, God, gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Now, the Midianites were enemies. They were surrounding nations. And so the Israelites have basically gotten to the place where they said, we're no longer going to live in obedience to God. And God said, if that's how you want to live, okay. How many of you know we serve a God that will let us walk down a path that he didn't choose for us? Sometimes we got to go after the things we want to discover that they're not the things that we need. And so all of a sudden, here's the nation of Israel, and they're in a pretty bad place. And for seven years, God says, okay, if that's what you want, I'm going to let you pursue that. And look at what happens, verse 2. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, strongholds. How many of you know if you are living in a cave, life is not good? Right? Can we all agree on that? You are God's chosen people and you're living in a cave, a mountain cleft, right? They are hiding. Life is not good. And so all of a sudden we're told, whenever, verse 3, whenever the Israelites planted their crops, look at this, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza. They did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. He's saying there was loads of them, tons of them. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. So literally, here's what would happen. The Israelites would plant their crops, their harvest would come up, and right about the time that they would harvest their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, the surrounding nations came in and basically put a whooping on them. Anybody here, just, I know this is kind of a moment of vulnerability, anybody here have a bully problem growing up? Can we just be honest? Some of us were like, I had a bully problem. Some of you, were you the bully? All right, more of those. Okay. 
Israel had a, has a bully problem going on, okay? This is where they are. They would raise up their crops, and then Midian and the Malachites would roll in there and basically steal their crops, take their animals, give them wedgies, and run off and ravage their land. You're like, I don't remember the wedgie part. It's in the message. It's, in, it's a paraphrase, all right? Literally would, would, would beat them up. And so here they are, the people of God, living in caves, having their lunch stolen from them all because they chose to ignore God and do things their own way. And so here, here we find in verse 6, it says, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. You ever been there? You ever been in that place where the bottom fell out? You never thought you would get here. I wasn't expecting that to happen. I never thought I could hit you know, such a low point. And in that low point, you thought, well, I've tried everything else. Might as well pray. You ever seen that bumper sticker, when all else fails, pray? Can I tell you, that's terrible advice. If that is the last play in your playbook, you need a new playbook, all right? How about before all else fails, pray? How about putting prayer as the first thing? But isn't it true that for many of us, right, oftentimes it's the last thing. You're like, dear God, I tried everything else. I didn't want to bother you. Can I tell you, your prayers are not a bother to God. And so here they are. You know, at wit's end, and they're throwing up a Hail Mary. Dear God, if you're out there, can you help us? And look at verse 7. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he ignored them. Is that what yours says? No. Verse 8 says he sent them a prophet. God's responding. He doesn't ignore you because you've been ignoring him. I tell you that just because you've been ignoring God doesn't mean that God is ignoring you. He hears you and he loves you. And he sends a prophet to them. And here's what the prophet says. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. So the prophet shows up and says, hey, I got a message for you. This is what God is saying. Listen up. And he brings a pretty harsh message. He says this. He says, this is what God says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. So God is saying, here's what, here's what I'm saying to you. Listen, didn't I bring you out of Egypt? Didn't I protect you? Didn't I provide for you? Didn't I lead you all the way to this promised land? I've done that. I'm your God. You're my people. I told you not to worship these false gods. And then look at what he says. He says, but, and these next six words had to have a little bit of sting to them. Let's all say them out loud together. But you have not listened to me. Can I tell you, ignoring God, not listening to God will lead you to some pretty rough places. We've probably figured that out. You've probably figured that out in your own life. God says, you haven't listened to me. You haven't listened to me. I want to be your God. You are my people, but you got to listen to me. You got to let me call the shots. And that's where many of us are at. We're at a place where we've wondered why in the world has the bottom falling out. Why am I dealing with the things I'm dealing with? God, where are you? And God's going, I haven't walked away from you. You walked away from me. But I want you to notice that when the people cried out to God that he responded. For many of you today, you are one prayer away. It means humbling yourself and calling out to God who loves you and he will answer. And look at what God does. Look at how he answers in verse 11. Verse 11 says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah. Not to be confused with Oprah, all right? All right, I just want to clear you guys and be like, Oprah is in the Bible. Did you know that? <laughs> Ophrah, Ophrah, all right? Ophrah means place of dust, okay? So the angel of the Lord comes down to Ophrah, and this place belonged to Joash, and his son Gideon was there. And this is important to note. His son Gideon, because he's the hero of our story, was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now, what do you think you're supposed to do in a wine press? You are supposed to press grapes that will then turn into wine. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press, all right? If you were to thresh wheat, and I know many of us, you're, you, you probably didn't thresh wheat before you came to church today, right? You were like, normally I do that on Sundays, but the weather wasn't working for me. I know, you know, we're not out threshing wheat. That's not something we do. So if you were to thresh wheat, let me kind of tell you what it would look like. You would go to an open part of land, you go to a clearing, and you would go out there and you would take the, the wheat and you would take it through, you'd have this big old basket that you would use to sift, and you would toss it up in the air, and the wind would catch the chaff and blow it away while the kernel would fall back down. 
And so that was how you would sort the chaff from the wheat. And so that's how you would thresh the wheat. So here's Gideon, and he's in a wine press. This is like a hole in the ground. He's down there, and he's throwing it up. The wind's not, I mean, he's, the wind isn't even going to catch the chaff and blow it away. He's down there. Why? Because he's afraid. He's afraid that if the Midianites see him, they're going to come down and take his wheat and give him a wedgie, right? He's terrified. This guy's hiding. And, and so it's just incredible to see that God's going to choose somebody to be a hero. So who does he go after? He goes after good old Gideon. And he approaches him down there as he's threshing wheat in this wine press out of fear. And he says this to him. Look at verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. You can almost hear the angel like snickering a little bit, right? The Lord is with you, mighty, mighty warrior, right? And look at Gideon's response. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. Pardon me. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Time out. Did God abandon them or did they abandon God? Gideon's perspective is so limited and many times so is ours. God, where are you? Why is this happening? You said you'd protect. You said you'd provide. Where are you, God? And I love how God didn't even, didn't even deal with that. Didn't even address that. Just let Gideon gripe. God will let us gripe. It's not a bad thing to gripe to God. Just know that when he responds, he's going to respond, and you need to hear it. And so Gideon is griping, and you, you abandoned us. You gave us in the hands of Midians, and the Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And Gideon responds, and he's like, uh, pardon, pardon me, Lord. Hold on. Pardon me, Lord, but uh, how can I save Israel? God, wait a second. I was complaining, and I was calling out to you so that you would fix this. Not so that you would use me to fix this. You ever been there? God, this is an injustice. Somebody needs to do something about this. Somebody needs to go help those hurting the poor. Somebody's got to help them. You ever been up late at night and you're flipping through the channels and then a commercial comes on and they're showing these little kids in a third world country and they've got distended bellies and flies are buzzing around their face and you're like, this is an injustice. God, you need to do something about this. And suddenly you feel this strange burden on your heart. And you're like, I didn't want you to do something in me. I wanted you to do something about that. And that's where Gideon's at. I want you to fix this, God. And God says, I am. I'm going to send you. And Gideon says, time out. Hold on. How can I save Israel? I love this question because this is a question all of us will wrestle with when God puts a burden and a calling on our heart. God, how, how can I talk to them? How can I go do something about that? How can you use me? I mean, look at his response. He goes on. He's like, whoa, whoa, time out, God. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. We're a bunch of nobodies, God. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. And Gideon replied, if now I've found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. <laughs> He's like, well, whoa, God, how do I know this isn't some crazy dream? You know, maybe I had a bad burrito. I don't know what's going on, God, but could you give me a sign? Because I am the least likely candidate to be used greatly by you. And I want you to write this down. We've been saying this every week of the series. If you haven't written it down yet, write it down. Would you get this? God is most likely to use who? The unlikely. Write this down. God is most likely to use the unlikely. Gideon is so unlikely. He's, so, he's such the least likely candidate. And I love when he's talking to God and he goes, God, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And God doesn't tell him how he's going to do it. He just says, I'm going to give you some strength. I'm going to go with you. When you begin to walk by faith, you begin to get really comfortable with the fact that God works on a need-to-know basis. And he will tell you what you need to know when you need to know it. He doesn't usually tell you what you need to know before you need to know it because he wants you to trust him and follow him. And so Gideon says, can you give me a sign? I want to know that I'm talking to you. And God gives him a sign, but it's not convincing enough. He's like, thank you, but can I get another sign? More specifically, God, here's what I want you to do. And Gideon takes this, this wool fleece. He says, here's what I want you to do, God. I'm going to put this fleece out tonight. I'm going to put it outside, 
And when I get up in the morning, here's how I'm going to know that this is you, okay? God, I'm going to put this fleece out, and when I get up, I want the fleece to be wet, but I want the ground all around it to be dry. So the dew only gets on the fleece, but not on the ground. So you can imagine he wakes up that next morning, he's excited, he goes out and checks, and the fleece is drenched. He wrings it out into a bowl, like tons of water, and he's like, okay, wow. All right, God, one more thing, one more sign. All right, one more sign. That was good, that was good, but let's try this again. This time, I'm going to take the fleece, I'm going to put it out, and this time, I want the fleece to be dry, but I want all the ground to be wet. And he goes to bed and gets up the next morning, and sure enough, God has done just that. And we're told that in that moment that the hand of favor of God and the Spirit of God comes upon Gideon, and he's filled with courage, and he begins to recruit an army. And he does a pretty good job, if you ask me. He sends out messengers to the surrounding areas, and he builds an army, 32,000 strong. 32,000 men, and all of a sudden, I mean, Gideon has stepped on the scene. I mean, this coward is filled with courage. He's got 32,000 men, and we turn the corner into chapter 7. Go to chapter 7 with me, and things are about to get ugly. Look at your neighbor and say, it's about to get ugly. No, it's about to get ugly. Yeah, watch this. Gideon's walking pretty tall with his 32,000 men, and in Judges 7, 1, the Bible says, early in the morning, Gideon and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The spring of Herod is also known as the spring of trembling, and you're about to discover why. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. Morah, they're about four miles away, so four miles between Gideon and his crew and the Midianites and all of their guys. And the Lord said to Gideon, look at this with me, let's read this next sentence together, ready? Read it out loud. God says, you have too many men. Say what? (laughs) Right? I mean, come on. How can I have too many men, right? If you're going to battle, how could you ever have too many soldiers, right? We've all heard strength in numbers, right? Too many men. This is ridiculous. Gideon's got 32,000 soldiers. Now, we eventually find out that the Midianites, the Amalekites, there's 120,000 of them, all right? So if you're a betting man, it's about four to one odds against Gideon here, right? It's not looking real good. This means that for every Israelite soldier, they're going to have to kill four of their enemies. I mean, that's a pretty big deal right there. So the odds aren't looking real good. And so all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of like, what what do you mean? I've got too many men. Look at what God says. He says, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me, saying my own strength has saved me. God says, if I let you go out there with all those men, you're going to walk away thinking you won this battle. You're going to think, look at what we did. We brought the victory. We're pretty bad. Look at us. And I want you to say, look at our God. And so here's what he says. Verse 3, look at this. Announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. This is not a good good call here, right? I got 32,000 people. Hey, listen, if anybody's afraid, you can go home. Okay, right? This is, not, this is not rallying the troops. How many of you know, I mean, fear is contagious. And so all of a sudden, look at what happens. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. You ever heard people say sometimes things got to get worse before they get better? It just got worse. In one moment, two-thirds of Gideon's army walks home. They leave. His odds just went from 4 to 1 to 12 to 1, Right? It's not looking good. And just when you think things can't get any worse, watch this, verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, let's all read this one together. There are still too many men. (laughs) Come on, God. He says this, take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. You thinned them out pretty good, God. You need need a a lesson in in how to fight battles because obviously this is your first, right? He says, go down to the water. I'll thin them out for you. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. And there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. So this is kind of a really strange way of, of, you know, separating people. So he says, if they go down and they scoop water in their hands and they lap it out of their hands like a dog, all right, put them over here. And if they just go down there and they kneel and they put their face in the water, you put them over here. 
And verse 6 says, 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest, 9,700, got down on their knees to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. Let all the others go home. So you got two groups of people, right? 300 here, 9,700 here. You're like, okay, you guys can all go home. Thank you. We don't, you're no longer needed. Be good. Have a great day. All of us, you ready? <laughs> These guys are like, are you kidding me? This is crazy. So we went from 4 to 1 odds to 12 to 1 odds to now they're about 400 to 1. This is crazy. I don't know if you know, you're a betting individual, we won't get into that, but 400 to 1 odds. Do you realize how big of odds these are? This would be like, for instance, are there any Milwaukee Bucks fans here? I didn't think so, okay? <laughs> so did a little research this week. The odds on the Milwaukee Bucks winning the NBA championship this year are 400 to 1. That's how great the odds are against Gideon. So basically, if you put $20 down on the Milwaukee Bucks, it would pay out $8,000, right? It's pretty, you know, pretty good chunk of change there. I'm not quite as good as uh, Rory McIlroy's uh, you know, dad's winnings. Did you guys hear about this just recently? His dad placed a bet. Some of you are like, Rory who? Rory's a golfer. And when he was 14 years old, 10 years ago, 2004, his dad placed a bet his dad bet 200 pounds, which is equivalent of about $341 U.S. dollars, made this bet in 2004 on 500 to 1 odds that in the next 10 years, his son Rory would win the British Open. Right? His son's 14. Dad's like, I'm making a bet that in 10 years, he's going to win the British Open. And sure enough, July 20th this year, Rory won the British Open, and his dad got a fat check of $171,000. All right, that's 500 to 1 odds, okay? So the odds are against Gideon, 400 to 1. So that's like every one of Gideon's men slaying 400 of theirs. I think we'd all say that this is, uh, this is pretty crazy, pretty crazy, but we learn a valuable lesson from this story. So often we look at our resources and we think, God, I don't have enough. And God looks at our resources and says, you have too much. So many times we look at what we don't have. And God says, you're overlooking who you do have. Isn't it true that when we feel like God is calling us to something, we immediately start counting how much is in the bank? What are my skills and abilities? What are my talents? What resources do I have? And we begin to look at what we don't have. And God says, you need to stop focusing on what you don't have. Start focusing on who you do have. I'm going to give you what you need. I'm going to be your strength. Our faith needs to be in who we have, not in what we have. I want you to write this down. On your gray note card, write this down. Unbelievable odds set the stage for undeniable miracles. Unbelievable odds set the stage for undeniable miracles. The reason God kept thinning Gideon's army is so that people would brag about how big and bad God is, how good God is, not how strong their army is. You see, you show me a situation that is out of your control, and I will show you an opportunity that is poised for a miracle. You show me circumstances that are bigger than you can handle, and I'll show you somebody that is situated in a perfect place for a miracle. Don't you want to see a miracle? Don't you want to see God do more than you could ever ask or imagine? Don't you want to experience that in your lifetime? See, we all want to see a miracle, but nobody wants to need a miracle. You ever thought about that? God, I want to see you do crazy, radical things. Just not in my life, because I want to be in a place where I need crazy, radical things. And yet when we walk by faith, God will lead us to circumstances that are so much bigger than we are. And it's in those moments that we have to decide, do we continue to walk by faith or do we shrink back? Do we live a life of logic and small-minded thinking and dreaming? Or do we say, no, I'm going to elevate my steps of faith to the size of my God. I'm going to follow you, God. And I'm going to trust that you are going to provide a miracle that is on time. I think we all agree in this moment, Gideon needs a miracle. Right? I mean, 400 to 1 odds, like, Gideon, you need a miracle. Uh, if you're going to win this thing, this is crazy. This is crazy. And God knows. He knows the, you know, what Gideon's feeling in his heart. He knows how overwhelmed he's feeling. And, and so literally in Judges chapter 7, verse 10, God says this. He says, if you are afraid to attack, which obviously who wouldn't be, right? If you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they're saying. And afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. 
So he, Gideon, and Purah went, his servant, they went down to the outpost of the camp. The Midianites, the Amalekites, and all the other eastern peoples had settled into the valley. They're thick as locusts. Their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the, on the seashore. That's a lot of camels right there, right? You guys been to the beach lately? Lots of sand. There's lots of camels, all right? Lots going on here. And so here's Gideon and his servant, and they sneak down to the camp, and they're eavesdropping. They're just looking. God says, I'm going to give you a sign, and you're going to be filled with courage. And Gideon arrived, verse 13, just as a man was telling a friend his dream. He says, I had a dream, he's saying. I had a dream. And he says this. He says, a round loaf of barley bread. Obviously, this guy went to bed hungry, right? You ever go to bed hungry and you start dreaming of food? You got to be real hungry when you're dreaming of barley bread, right? I'd be like, man, I had a dream and this steak was rolling through. That's what I would say. You know, some bacon is what I was dreaming of. Not him. He's dreaming about barley bread. He says, a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp and it struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. And his friend responded, listen to his response, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. And when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and he worshiped and he returned to the camp of Israel and he called out, get up. Get up, the Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. See, God knew that what Gideon needed was to be filled with courage. He needed to know that God has not forsaken him, that God is on his side, and he overhears this conversation. And he's filled with courage, and he goes back, and he says, All right, everybody, troops on your feet, all 300 of you. Let's get ready. Let's go. God is doing a miracle here, and I want you to write this down. Underdogs who overcome, get up. Would you write this down? Underdogs who overcome, get up. You know, we all get down in life. We all get to places where life deals us a bad hand. We all find ourselves in a place where we're the underdog, where the odds are against us. There's always going to be a giant opposing us. And in that moment, we're going to realize, man, we're outnumbered. We're outclassed. We're overwhelmed. And I want to tell you in that moment, you got to get up anyway. you got to rise to your feet. you got to get back up. There's going to be opportunities in life where you get knocked down. But we've got to get back on our feet and we've got to get up. Life is going to knock you down. I saw this t-shirt online the other day and it said, when life knocks you down, do a burpee. Anybody know what a burpee is? I learned what a burpee is in CrossFit. Burpees are, uh, they were invented in hell. All right, just in case you're not sure. Those of you are like, what's a burpee? Here's a burpee, okay? So you basically drop down and you pop up, you clap over your head. That's a burpee. So I thought, okay, this is good advice. When life knocks you down, do a burpee. Life knocks you down, boom, oh, do a burpee. You know, pop up. There you go. You ain't got nothing on me, life. Is that all you got when life knocks me down? Boom. Do a burpee. Imagine if we did burpees every time life knocked us down. Man, we'd all be like ripped. Like, how'd you get so built? Well, I did a burpee every time life knocked me down. I showed up to work and my boss was like, hey, I got some bad news. You're like, time out. <laughs> Boom. Is that all you got? The doctor said, hey, listen, I need to tell you. So hold on. Boom. Is that all you got? Bring it. Let me tell you, burpees get exhausting. Sometimes you do a burpee and you hit the bottom. You're like, I'm just going to stay here for a bit. I'm just going to leave a sweat angel right here. But listen, in those moments, you got you to get back up. Because it's when you get back up that God says, I'm going to be your strength. I'm going to equip you. When you get knocked down, get back up. You say, you know what? I'm getting up. I realize in life I will get knocked down. It's going to happen. You know what? I get knocked down. But I get up again. Nothing's ever going to keep me down. I get knocked down and I get up again. Nothing's ever going to keep me down. You got to get comfortable with that. What have you got? There's nothing that could be thrown at me that is bigger than the God who can sustain me. I got this because God's got my back. And all of a sudden you look at this moment and Gideon says, guys, get up, wake up, stand up. This is our moment, and I want to tell you today, you may feel like an underdog, but underdogs who overcome, they get up. And the rest of this story, oh, it's incredible. Gideon takes his 300 men. Imagine being a part of this army. Takes his 300 men, and, and listen, if you've never read this story, go back and read it, okay? We've had to skip over a few little parts, and if this series does nothing other than spark a desire on your part to just start reading the stories in Scripture, then I think this series has been a success. The Scripture is full of incredible, incredible stories. So Gideon takes his 300 men 
and he equips all of them. We're told they have three things. They have a pot, because you know everybody needs a pot to go to battle, right? They have a torch, and they have a trumpet, right? You're like, wait a second, what kind of battle, what are we going to cook them dinner? What are we doing here? Play them a song? What's happening? And so he takes his 300 men, and in the middle of the night, they circle around the camp of the Midianites. And Gideon says, listen, guys, listen. On my mark, all right, on my mark, I'm going to shout. And when I do, you're going to smash the pots, you're going to shout, you're going to hold up the torches, then you're going to blow the trumpets, and we're going to see what God does. Check this out. Gideon gets everybody set on his mark. He shouts. They smash the pots. And look at Judges chapter 7, verse 21. It says, while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying as they fled. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. And all of a sudden, the Midianites took off. So Gideon and his guys stand at the top of the hill, and they smash their pots, and they blow their trumpets, and they hold their torches. And the Midianites wake up only to see all around them there's flames all around them. Those flames would have represented like, like um, just whole groups of troops. They don't realize it's just one man. They have no idea. It's just one dude with a pot and a broken pot at that and a trumpet and a torch. And they begin to just panic and they don't know who's their friend and who's their foe and they start fighting each other and they take off. And in the most crazy way, God brings the victory with 300 men. And in this, we learn a valuable lesson. And it's simply this. When the odds are against you, God is for you. God is for you. If the odds are against you and you're walking in faithfulness with God, the odds are not against you. God is bigger than the odds. And you need to walk in confidence and in faith that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. He will complete it. Your job and mine is to be faithful, to take steps in obedience to God and watch him bring the victory. Would you pray with me?